And this next verse talks also about our gold and our success. And the world today looks at success as riches and fame and material possessions or having their way and having their rights. But true success is nobleness, righteousness. And that can only come from the Lord. Every gain, let's, let's pray today that every gain that our nation seeks, and it would be such a miracle of God, but it would be a divine gain. That we would gain in righteousness, that people would be saved through these next years, these trying years ahead of us. That people would be coming to know the Lord because we're out there in those fields bringing the true righteousness and truth of Jesus Christ. So let's sing this next verse and make it your prayer. among those in our nation. Move among the Christians, God, the church, Lord, that you would open blinded eyes, God, fearful eyes, Lord. We look about us, we look and see what the news says, what the reports say, what the media says, God, and it's so distorted, Lord. Your truth is the only truth. And God, I pray that you'd lead us in that truth. Father, I pray you'd come against the fear, God, that, that people are facing, Lord, for tomorrow, God, for our nation our help, Lord, for our provision, everything, God, Satan is just bringing so much fear, and we pray, God, that we would have your eyes to see and your ears to hear, that we wouldn't believe the report, God, of unbelief, God, of, of fear, but, Lord, we'd believe the report that your word says, God, and we would be shining lights, Lord, bold, God, to go out, Lord, and use this opportunities, God, to tell people that you are the truth, and you are the way, and you are the light.
just pray for a moment. Let's just thank the Lord that he has conquered, that Jesus has overcome, he has prevailed, and he did it for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. We worship you today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that you give us through Jesus. We thank you for the hope that you give us through Jesus. Oh God, we magnify your name today, Lord. We celebrate you, God. We extol you, Lord. We worship you. And Father, we pray that you would draw us close to you, God, that there'd be such intimacy with you, Lord, that we would abide close in your presence. Father, we thank you, God, that when we pray that you hear us and we know that you hear us, Lord. We know that you love us, Lord. And Father, we just return this love back to you, this worship to you, this praise to you, God. We thank you, Father, that you open the blind eyes. You heal the cripples, Father. We thank you so much for the glory and the liberty and the victory that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh, God, we thank you. In just a moment, we're going to take communion together. And if you did not receive a little communion packet, and you would like the ushers to hand you one, just raise your hand and they'll bring you one. If anybody here does not have one. Amen. That song, Oh the Blood. Can we just sing that chorus? Oh the Blood of Jesus. You know, as you are receiving these packets, you can go ahead and open them. Um, there would be no victory. There would be no conquering of the grave, no healings, no opening of the eyes if it were not for the, the sacrifice of Jesus and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we thank the Lord for what he has done for us and the offering up of himself and the cross. Just take this moment and commune with the Lord. He said that as often as we do it, we are to remember him. And just to remember what he's done. I just want to sing this little chorus, Oh, the blood of Jesus. But I wanted to read this to you. For when Jesus began his ministry, in his hometown, he opened up the scrolls in the synagogue. And he read from the gospel of Isaiah, or the book of Isaiah. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and he sat down and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue fastened on him. And he began to say to them, praise God, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Hallelujah. The scripture was fulfilled in their ears. And from that point on, it would be fulfilled before their eyes. I want you to think about that. Faith comes by hearing. It starts in our ears. And then from that hearing will come the tangible evidence of what you've heard. And they began to see not only what they heard, didn't just hear it, but they began to see it. They saw the blind healed. They saw the lame walk. They saw the poor received. They saw the gospel preached to all people. They saw the captives set free. They saw it, but first they heard it. And Father, we thank you today that we also can see what our ears hear. And we thank you, Lord, that it was all fulfilled in your son, Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. And just as you would, take that communion right now. Call is just going to sing this chorus, Oh, the Blood of Jesus. You can just sing it if, if you would and just pray and commune with the Lord for a moment. If there's anything in your life that you need to confess or repent of before God, that communion represents the fact that God is not against you. He has not come to condemn you. 
but to save you and to help you. And even now, He is here to help you and to save you. It is the means of reconciliation within the body of Christ. It is the means of communion and companionship within His body. Everything is there. Don't just recognize the death of the human body of Jesus, but recognize His church as well. Discern that body of Jesus Christ. And let us take of it worthily by the blood of Jesus today. Thank you, Lord. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. It washes white as snow. And oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Come on, sing it with us. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Everybody. Oh, the blood of Jesus. done that for you just lift your hands to him right now and just thank him he's removed your sins from you as far as the east is from the west he receives you into his everlasting habitation and loves you with an everlasting love he says in his word that your sins and your iniquities he will not remember praise god thank you lord thank you lord and Father, just as you have forgiven us, let us forgive one another, God. Let us love with the love that you give. And we thank you, God, for your precious Holy Spirit, Father, who makes it all possible. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Just want to um, just let you know we're really grateful to be able to have this service with you today. Um, I'm going to be reading today out of John 14. And so I just invite you to, to have that passage with you and prepared because we're just going to go to some other chapters, but we're going to stay there primarily this morning. And um, I just wanted y'all to know um, that this is such a difficult time in our world and trying to navigate this is like trying to navigate in the center of a tornado. Um, you know, even, uh, you know, in the world of men, government, science, everything else, ideas have changed over the last three months. Um, even advice and things like that have changed over the last three months. Um, one, one direction that we thought was going to be beneficial wasn't, and so change is made. Um, things that were going to be helpful ended up not being helpful, and, and so changes were all implemented. Basically saying, our world has never faced anything like this before in its history. What is going on in our world today is so catastrophic and it is so unique. And man is really just scrambling to know what to do. And so even in the church, you know, we're, we're, we're seeking to do the best that we can do for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. And that is our desire. You know, what is good for the kingdom of God? And, um, and so trying to proceed, trying to do the right things and hearing from some of you, thank you. Hearing from some of you, we have this service here at nine o'clock and we're, we're grateful to be able to come and have worship together with you, have a, have a time of study in God's word and pray together. And then, um, and also let it be an environment in which hopefully and prayerfully you will feel safe, um, as far as your health is concerned and so forth, because that is very important to us. And, um, and so I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your prayers. I thank you for your feedback. Um, it, is, it is very accepted from us because we're just trying to walk through this together with you. 
um, keeping our ears close to the mouth of God as we can to know what it is that he's telling us and what he wants us to do. So we just appreciate you. If there's any needs that are in your life, please let us know. Anything that we can do to help you or serve you or minister to you in whatever way it is, even to go pick up groceries for you and bring them to your house, whatever it may be, you know, uh, lawn work, whatever you might need going on in, in your life. So please let us know because we understand these are very disturbing times. And again, I just want to thank you and I want to appreciate you being here um, this morning. We've, we've been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that Luke writes in Acts chapter 1 is about all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And so it is so important for us to understand, and I want us to understand this to do as well, that it is important. What Jesus said, we know is truth. We know it is doctrinal. We know it is life-saving. For example, when in John 6, Jesus said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And the multitudes just really left him at that moment. And he's really standing there with his 12 disciples. And he asked them, are you going to leave me as well? And, and they said to him, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so Jesus' words are eternal. They are eternal life. That word gets in you. And that word fastens itself upon your heart and your life. And it really changes you. It really dictates everything about your life from that point. And so I, I want to express how important Jesus' words are. But I also want to stress to you how important his works are. The miracles of Jesus, the works of Jesus. I read this to you just a minute ago in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus read this from the, God, from, from the book of Isaiah. He goes and he sits down and he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. And I just think that is so marvelous because they heard it first and then they would see it done. And we hear the word of God, and then we're going to see the demonstration of God. He told the disciples in Mark chapter 16, this is the great commission of Matthew 25, to, to, or Matthew 18 for them here in Mark 16, go into all the world. Well, they did. And these signs followed them because God worked with them. And so I just want us to understand this is a supernatural life that we are living as believers. It is supernatural and anything less than that is really just not biblical Christianity. We ought to be able to say in our life today, if you're not listening to what I'm saying, look what is happening and let the things that are happening validate what we are saying. That is the desire of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the church doesn't have that power in itself. You and I don't have that power in ourselves, but the Holy Spirit wants to do something in our life where he can say to the world, listen to what I'm telling you and look at what I'm doing so you will know that's why you should listen to what I'm saying. And so Jesus did that. You're going to see that in John 14 today about Jesus making a comment of that to one of his disciples. But Y'all, this is a very unique time in human history. It is a unique time in our world. And so the world is really turned upside down and inside out. We have heard from uh, missionaries and pastors and churches in other parts of the world where people are starving. I mean, there is no food, there is no produce, there, there is no avenues. And I thank God that we're able to help these people. I thank God that we have been able to send finances into all parts of the world to help buy people's food. We have bought pastors and their families food. If you're not giving to this, I really encourage you to do it. Because I don't think there's anything more worthwhile that we could be doing right now than to help the saints of God. Galatians 6 tells us that. And so just to have love for one another, we've paid mortgages, we've paid pastor's mortgages, we've paid the mortgages of churches, even one of our churches here in Baton Rouge in the inner city, twice we've paid the church's mortgage so that it could continue to function out on Plank Road, and a beautiful pastor, great friend of ours, um, and so I thank God for all of that, we're, we're, the church is moving, the church is going, the church is doing the work of God, the church is advancing the kingdom. 
The church is love in the body of Christ. And these are the avenues that you also have access to to contribute to these things that we're doing right now that I believe is right before us to do. And so I just encourage you to, to know that. Um, and in the condition that our world is in, the situation that it is in, it is very disturbed and people are very troubled. And so I want to read this in John 14. The Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And I want to talk today about the answer to a troubled heart, the answer to a troubled life. I'll be honest with you. There's probably not a day that has gone by that my heart has not been troubled and I had to fight to keep its peace. There's probably not been a moment in my life, especially through these last few months, um, particularly since March, where there hasn't been a disturbance or a, or a fear or something that has attacked me or tempted me to just give up, to give in, to quit. What's the use or what is going to happen? Oh God, what do we do? And, and I thank God I have come to this passage so many times for my strength. And I really believe the Lord taught me something out of this on the answer for a troubled heart. So I want to share it with you. And I pray that it will be strength in your life. Not words in your head, but the word in your spirit. And it will be strength for your life. So he says again, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Then Jesus is going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And at the end of this conversation about the Holy Spirit, he comes back to this, let not your heart be troubled in verse 27. And he adds something to it. So I want you to see this. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. And here it is again. Let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid. Now, when you read verse one and verse 27, there is a responsibility on our part. And the responsibility is self-evident right there. Let not your heart. You have to guard your heart. You have to guard what is coming into your heart. You have to fight what is trying to disturb your heart. You have to fight what is an infiltration of the enemy against your peace that you have in God. All right. I can't fight that for you. You can't fight that for me. But God gives us provisions by which we fight the trouble and the fear that would seek to attack our hearts. And the simplicity of that is always Jesus. He is our peace and he is present with us by his Holy Spirit. And so that's the simplicity of the answer. But there are many factors in it so that Jesus actually is personal and real in your heart, living in your heart, alive in your heart, so that you have peace and you have confidence and not trouble. So I want to look at verse 1 and verse 27, and I want to look at these two things, the word troubled and the word afraid. And I want to define these things to you. The word troubled, let not your heart be troubled, means to agitate, to disturb, or to disquiet. There's a peacefulness, and it's disturbed, and it's disquieted. Um, it, is, it is termed in the Strong's definition of this, the roiling of water. Not boiling, like you boil it. The roiling of water, which I had no idea what that meant. And it basically means to put, your, put something into a peaceful pond, just still water. It's peaceful. You're, you're walking through a meadow and you see this pond and it's just so red. You see reflection in it and you put something in it. You royal the water. You disturb it and you move it. It could be very clear and you just put your foot in it. And when you put your foot in it, the, the dirt and the mud now is all stirred up and there's no reflection there. And the peace right there is disturbed. It is unsettled. And that is the trouble, the kind of trouble that Jesus is talking about. Don't you let the things that are going on in the world step on your heart or step into your heart or royal the peace of your heart. Don't let something be thrown in there that just disturbs the peace. Don't let it happen. That is what we have to guard. 
And then the word afraid in verse 27 is the word timid. Don't let your heart be troubled and don't be timid. And so that's a unique um, definition here because I would have just imagined it would have been very fearful. Like you're afraid of a, of, of some, you know, we were in Arkansas, up in the mountains of Arkansas this past week preaching up there in the most amazing camp meeting I've ever been a part of in my life. And, um, and so it's just, I mean, been going over 40 years. We're in the top of these hills and there's spot, about six or 700 people there and they have bears coming down to the cafeteria to get the food out of the dumpsters, you know. I'm afraid. <laughs> I've always been a little bit, you know, afraid of bears or maybe a lot. Bears and snakes. And so I was, I'd have to get people to go to the men's room with me because I, I wanted them to have the bear attack rather than me. You know, I was afraid, you know. So this was the kind of fear that I would be thinking Jesus was talking about. You know, there's a fear going on in the world, but that's not really the word. It's timid. And so I want you to read, keep your place here and go to 2 Timothy. And I want you to just understand this. And I know you know this by heart. But the Bible says in 2 Timothy verse one, chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, which means timidity. It's the same word. I haven't given you the spirit of timidity. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sound mind meaning wisdom and soundness. So I give you power. I give you love. I give you a sound mind. That is the spirit of God. Now, isn't that interesting? Think about that. Think about what, what you just read. There's a spirit of fear. God does not give that. A spirit of timidity. God does not give that. God gives the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Think about that. It's very interesting. When you look at John 14, you're talking about the spirit of the Lord. He says, don't be timid because I'm not giving you that. I'm giving you the spirit of the Lord. So that you can be strong and courageous and you can be wise in, in all regards of life. That is what I am doing for you. In Romans chapter 8, there's another little verse here I want you to see in verse 15. And he says here in Romans 8, 15, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? That's what our Father gives us. He gives us the spirit of adoption, the spirit of God, the spirit of Jesus Christ, not the spirit of bondage. Jesus brought us out of bondage. And so he's not bringing us back into it. And he gives us, this is so beautiful, I want you all to get this. He gives us the Holy Spirit so that we don't have to be troubled and we don't have to be timid. He gives, that's only by, left to ourselves, we're going to be troubled. And left to ourselves, we're going to be afraid. But with the Holy Spirit, there is power. The clothing of power and the clothing of life. That's what he gives to us. And so going back to John 14, I want to give you about five things that the Lord showed me to be aware of, to by grace, pray for and believe and expect in my life. On a daily basis and sometimes many times through the day. I am believing this and I am expecting this. So Jesus tells us this. The answer for a troubled heart. The answer for a courageous spirit is number one to believe. Number one believe. He tells us that in verse one of chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You believe in God. You believe in Jesus. Believe in him. Believe in the son of God. Believe in God. And so faith. Faith is right there at the very beginning. To, to plot our way through troubled times in our life. Where our hearts are attacked with disturbance and fear. What we have to do is believe. I have to believe God. I'm going to believe in Jesus Christ. And he said that. Believe in God. You believe in God. Believe also in me. And so that is how I attack the things that want to trouble my heart or disturb my life. I'm going to believe in God. And so I want to break this up into three things in believing. Number one, believe in Jesus. I want you to see this in verse uh, 7 of John 14. 
This is his conversation with Philip. And he says this to the disciples. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it suffices us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the father. And how sayest thou then, show us the father? Believest thou not that I am in the father and the father in me? Now here's what I was telling you earlier. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me. There it is again. So many times. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very works sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. The works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, I'm going to talk about this for just a moment, about believing in Jesus, and believing who he is, and believing that he was sent from the Father. And why was he sent from the Father? To redeem you, to save you, to be your God, to be your Lord. To be your ever constant friend. To never leave your side. To never abandon you. To never fail you. To never disturb your faith and your life. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our life. If there's anything in my life right now that is disturbing my faith or attacking my faith or seeking to weaken my faith, that doesn't come from Jesus. He's the author and the builder of my faith. I need to believe him. Believe in him. If I am to know the father, I must know the son. He is the way. He tells us this in John 14. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so if I want to be strong in my heart, peaceful in my heart, at rest in my heart, and full of courage in my heart, I need to believe in Jesus Christ, the son of God. Not as a theory or as a theology, but as a reality in my life. Secondly, I need to believe in his heaven. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. I need to believe that. I need to believe that this world is not my home. I need to believe that there's something much better waiting for me beyond here. I need to believe that the cause of Jesus Christ, that he came into the world for to die brutally on a cross, was, was worth everything to the glory of his father. I need to believe in that heaven. I need to long for that heaven. The Bible says in Hebrews that for the joy that was set before Jesus, he endured the cross. I know there's a lot of things that were in that joy, but I can tell you one of the great things that was in that joy is in just a few hours, I'm going home. In just a few hours, I'll be back in heaven. In just a few hours, I'll be back with my father. And all of the pain and all of the suffering and all of the disturbances that tries to wreck our peace down here will be absent from my life forever. And I can live in that heavenly mind right now by believing. So I'm going to believe in heaven. I'm going to believe that I'll be with God forever. I'm going to believe in a life of eternal peace, eternal rest, eternal blessing. I'm going to walk with God and live with God. No more sin, no more devils, no more sickness, no more COVID, nothing like that. No more riots and looting in the streets. We're going to be in that place with God. And then the third thing that I need to believe in the rapture. I need to believe in the rapture. You believe in my father's house, believe also in me. If it weren't true, I would have told you I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you can be also, and I'm coming again to get you. I need to believe in that. I need to believe that Jesus could come right now. If I was suffering something horrifically, if I was suffering some form of persecution, I would believe maybe the rapture will happen before they can chop my head off, you know? I'm going to be raptured. Jesus is coming for me. He is, he is overwhelmed the sting of sin and the strength of sin and the grave and death and my sin. And I'm going to be raptured. I'm going to be with God. He loves me. He's, he's married to me and I'm married to him. And Jesus is coming to get me. Oh, praise God. You know, and when I think about Jesus and I think about heaven and I think about the coming of the Lord, I promise you, I get happy. 
I get happy. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to live for God. I'm ready to bring people to Jesus. I, I mean, that excites me about God, you know? And so it gives me peace. The second thing, that w- the first is to believe. And the second thing is to work now by that belief. Work. And I, I, would, I would say that's what he tells us to do. And I would say that is faith. We just read that. In John 14, verse 12, Verily I say unto you, He that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. So if you believe, then work in that belief. Do the works of Jesus Christ. What would Jesus be doing? What would Jesus do? Because I'll tell you, the Spirit of Jesus is inside of you. And he's inside of me. And he might do something different in me that he's doing in you. But I can guarantee you one thing. The Holy Spirit is not sleeping. I guarantee you one thing. The end of the world has come upon us. The end of the age is here. And I can tell you like never before. There is an agenda and there is a mission of the Holy Ghost in the earth. Before the rapture of the church and the end of the world. That he wants to do something. What is that he wants to do in you? And I can tell you this. It's supernatural. It is supernatural. It is comparative to the things that Jesus did. Comparative to that. I'm talking about miracles. Jesus was able to say to the disciples, listen, if you're not believing what I'm saying, I'm telling you, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When are you going to get this? But if you're not believing me because of the things that I'm telling you, and I only say what he says, then look, believe me for the work's sake. And if you really believe that, then what I'm doing, you're going to do. You're going to do this as well. And so I've said this so much. I want to say it so much more. I I want this to just be maybe a constant theme in our life because I believe it is so precious. I believe it is so true. And it's a picture for me. I was telling somebody the other day, there's a difference between the way we teach and the way the Holy Spirit teaches. Because when I teach you, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you line upon line, precept upon precept. I'll give you some information, explain it. Our brains kind of filter through that and we, okay, I get it. I understand that. Now what's the next thing? And we bring the next thing into that. That's how we teach. But when the Holy Spirit teaches, it's just boom. Yeah, I get it. I get it all. I see it all. It's right there because it's revelation. You see it. You see what he's saying. You have the knowledge of the thing in all of his fullness. And so that is just so wonderful. And and the thing that I want you to understand is this. Because it's the picture that I have. Hebrews says that Jesus is the full expression of the Father. He is the complete expression of God the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Jesus was given a human body. And in that human body, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived. And everywhere he went, everything he did, everything he said, at the end of his life, before they would take his life in the cross, he would be able to say to everybody, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. He was able to say that, and and nobody could deny it. He was given that human body. And I want you to know, as Jesus Christ was given a body to be the revelation of the Father to the world, I believe the Holy Spirit has been given a body called the church to be the revelation of Jesus to the world. I believe that the Holy Spirit should have such freedom within the body of Christ that he redeemed through the cross and purchased with his own blood out of every race, tribe, and tongue, Jews and Gentiles brought together as one to be his house, that he ought to be able to live in it. And what Jesus did when he was on the earth, that church is doing the same thing. And at the end of this age, when he brings his church up, we ought to be able to say as we're going up in the rapture, if you've seen us, you've seen Jesus. That, that sh- sadly, this body of the church does not always accommodate the Holy Spirit. Jesus' human body never argued with him. But the body of the church, we quench him, we resist him, we deny him in so many ways. And oh to God, in these last few moments of history, we will let him have his perfect way in our life. So we have to work. And the, f- the third thing that we must do is pray. In verse 13... He says, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And so we pray. There's nothing more advantageous to our life than prayer. I'm not talking about saying prayers. 
I'm talking about really praying, praying in the Holy Ghost. This is the spirit that God gave us. I'm talking about praying in the Holy Spirit, intimacy with God, the knowledge of God, which brings me to the fourth point, and that's love, love. So you believe, you work by faith in what you believe, you pray, and you love him. You love him. You sincerely love him. You sincerely desire God. And the Bible brings these things out in, in John 14. He goes on and he says um, just beautifully in this about the spirit of truth that is coming. He is the comforter that is going to be sent in his name. He's not going to leave us comfortless. And so these are the beautiful things that he says. And he says in verse 21, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my father and I will love him and I, I will manifest myself to him. And Judas, not the betrayer. Ask him, you know, you'll manifest yourself to us and not the world. We don't understand. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. These things I've spoken unto you, being yet present. And so he tells us that we'll love him. In John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you. There's his commandment. Love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And then he tells us in John 15, verse 12, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. In verse 17, these things I command you, that you love one another. And so the commandment of Jesus is to love. And if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll love one another. It's just as simple as that. And the only way we can love as he is loved is by the spirit of love that he sends to us. The Holy Spirit of God. And so we love him that way. But listen, beloved, if you keep your place here, and I won't be much longer. In Ephesians chapter 3, I want you to see this is not automatic. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of Jesus Christ in your heart is not automatic because you're born again. There is something that has to happen in your life by the work of the Spirit of God in your life. And so I, I want to assure you of this. And this is the prayer of Paul to the Ephesians in chapter 3. And he says that, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints the breadth, length, depth, and height. And to know the love of Christ that your brain cannot know. I'm just paraphrasing that. It passes knowledge. Your brain can't know it. This is revealed to your inner man by the Spirit of God to believers. Not, I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm not talking about going up to some lost person. I want to share the gospel with you. Do you want to pray for Jesus to come into your heart? This is Paul praying for the church that they might experience Jesus in their heart. Because it's not automatic. And so this passes knowledge and that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Chapter 4 verse 18 and 19 talks about what this really means. It talks about not being alienated from the life of God through ignorance. That's the way the Gentiles live. That word alienated means a non-participant. A lack of familiarity. It is possible for you and I as Christians to be born again. Have faith in God. And yet have a lack of familiarity with Jesus Christ in our spirit. The, our familiarity with him is, is in the words of a book. In the notes, in our notebooks, in our theologies, we know him thoroughly through that. We know him thoroughly through doctrine. We know him thoroughly through theology. But the experience and the love that surpasses knowledge, I'm unfamiliar with that in my own life. And if we're unfamiliar with that presence of God in our hearts, how easy will it be for our hearts to be troubled? Because he is the Prince of Peace. And if the Prince of Peace is not really living in my heart, even though I confess my faith in him and I believe I'm saved and I'm going to be with Jesus forever, 
My heart can be so easily troubled and agitated and disturbed. Though I know so much, I have not experienced that intimacy. I want that. And this comes by the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful provision John 14 is. He gives us his spirit so that we might know all of that. And then the, the last point in having a peaceful heart is to receive it all. To receive it all. You don't have to receive it. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to do it. And you also don't have to have a peaceful heart. And you also don't have to have courage. You can have trouble and you can have fear in your heart by re rejecting it. Or you can receive. And what are you receiving? You're receiving his very own spirit. It's just, that's the grace. All of this, the believing, the working, the loving, the praying is all by the provision of his very own self into my life. And I just receive him. And when I receive him, I have his peace. And I have his stability. And I just read these last few to you in verse 16. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. And I talk about receiving because it says the world won't receive him. But you have received him. So walk in him and live in him. And let him be your strength and your portion in life. The baptism of the spirit is a complete immersion of your entire being. Your soul, spirit and body into the Holy Spirit. It is not a partial feeling or symbolic or temporary. Every part of your being is dipped and thoroughly bathed in his precious life. Permanently and continuously, you're experiencing the waves of his filling and the waves of his influence. It is not a one-time event. This filling of the Holy Spirit. But it is a constant and daily and multiple times through the day. Of a refilling and a renewing of the Holy Spirit in our life. And this is what is so beautiful. So beautiful. And I pray that you will have this. Being filled with God is about real enablement. Real strength of character. Healing in the body. Divine protection. Wisdom. And an increase in intelligence. Favor. And all the goodness we need to live this life with he is the dynamic means by which we can say if you've seen us you've seen Jesus father I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ father that you will bring just the reality of these beautiful truths into our life thank you that you have made provision for our hearts in a world that you knew was going to be very difficult to live in you knew the problems and the tribulations that would be here. And you left us your very own spirit. Not for us to get by, but for us to walk in absolute victory. And to enjoy the victory you've gained. And Father, please, in these last moments of history, I pray that you will be able to say through your church, if you've seen the church, you've seen Jesus. God, may we be so one. We ask it all in his precious name, for his honor and for his glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Please let us know if there's anything that you need, anything we can do for you. But we love you very much. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. I pray this has been a blessing for you. I pray that it's been an environment you feel safe in. And, um, and still there's plenty of room for other people to come. And uh, be in here and still have safe distance between one another, which is what we're going to strive to preserve for you in these nine o'clock meetings. So I, I hope to see you again next Sunday. Um, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.